Hello everyone, today we talk about the predatory nature of Roman-Italic warfare during the Roman conquest of Italy. I made recently a video about that that I saw you were pretty interested in. Uh, and today we're going to dwell on, on this particular aspect um, that has been framed, well, in fact Roman-Italic warfare has been framed as a sort of contrast, at least because the same uh, late Republican uh, Roman sources essentially hinted that as a clash between the, the mountain folks and the uh, the inhabitants of the plains, but that is actually much uh, more connected, of course, to a political uh, and properly imperial and sacred uh, struggle, right, over, over the control of, of course, of resources, but generally speaking, also of what hand been seen as uh, a divine mandate to to fulfill, especially from from the Roman side, but it, it just by by the scale of her accomplishment, not because the others wouldn't believe in the same thing. This is this is a very interesting topic because you know that we have been appreciating uh, the the imperial ideology in a traditional military sense, and um, it's a bit unveiling uh, the. Uh, you know the the nature of the same cultural acquisitions that we somehow give for granted and that we have been habituated to just you know divert our attention from and trying to give some strange deterministic mechanistic materialistic explanation to, but that actually uh, reside within the the heart of man um the nature of Rome's early warfare is what I described, especially in the centuries before um, the siege of Bay. So we're talking actually before the fourth century BC, because that's when uh, the um, the Roman military was properly structured as um, an imperial instrument, right? And when things, in fact, began to change with the siege of Bay in 406. BC traditionally, but we realize that m much of what fundamentally is connected with the genesis of the manipular religion had to do with a um, dramatic uh, renewal in, um, in Roman expansionistic aims from Latium uh, to, uh, to the rest of the Italian peninsula. However, one must understand the triggers as well. We will talk better, hopefully, about the, the Italic peoples as such, right? What kind of threat they pose to Rome, um, which is also often what you, you don't really think about. Like, our picture is that the Romans are somehow the Nazis of the ancient world. They conquered everything without any uh, other purpose than, you know, being the, the next door bully. Right, and this is not quite or having at least uh, a hegemonic uh, mania, as if you know the, the world was just you know standing still, waiting to be uh, conquered. Well, that's uh, without doing anything. That's not actually how the system worked. Not just, of course, every people believed exclusively that the systematic subjugation of their neighbors was the only uh, purpose of existence. But um, the situation in which Rome found herself, essentially since the fall of the, since the end of the, the Etruscan hegemony, let's put it in this way, you know, in the Roman sagas, it's the end of, of the Etruscan monarchy and the rebellion, in fact, of especially the, the Roman uh, oligarchy, the patres, uh, would open to still the, the question of how to cope with the gap that had essentially created at the contraction of Etruscan power. This is a major topic. Actually, today we're not going to discuss it per se, but just observing it. Like, the Etruscans had um, hegemonized practically the entire Tyrrhenian Italian coast. This meant that Rome had found herself, in fact, between uh, the Etruscan Dodecapolis and the Hellenic colonies of southern Italy, and that the Etruscan hegemony had used Rome also as a sort of bridge, right, to control um, uh, the, the coastland uh, as far as Cuma and further south. Um, 
which entailed um, a massive amount of power deriving from the quite flooded resources of, in fact, Latium, the so-called Campania Felix, exactly because of her, you know, prosperity uh, agriculturally, uh, you know, also coastally, and so on. The same Etruria was very rich. The Tyrrhenian islands, for example, of Elba, where the Etruscans dug um, mostly iron, mine uh, iron. And um, that was all part of a broader network that, at this point, already entailed for large cities like Rome already was. For example, grain imports from Sicily, right, which is a major, as you know, um, economical mechanism until the, the very end of the of the empire and and beyond, actually, because Rome would be connected to such uh, imports even during the Middle Ages. So we're talking about a um, a, a tremendous, we well, had to appear, at least from, of course, the glorious um, accomplishment of the patrician uh, uh, establishment in Rome. Um, quite a dramatic situation. I mean, this is made clear by the sagas that the myths that, you know, Latium was engulfed from there on in a series of clashes over, uh, for for supremacy that were uh, embittered by essentially the unhinged um, uh, raids, as we will see today, most of it, we can talk about invasions, migrations as well, of peoples from the Apennine. Right? In my videos about uh, archaic Roman warfare, I stressed, of course, a bit uh, the dichotomy we will observe here between kind of the more civilized, um, in fact, uh, cities of the Tyrrhenian coastland and the brutal as primitive and warlike uh, tribes of the Apennine uh, heartland, right? Uh, much was in between, because essentially Rome still derived from that Italic background. Uh, the Italics, in turn, had been kind of slightly more civilized, say, than, you know, the the Celts or, or and other Central European populations, but uh, there was prior to, to the Roman conquest, of course, no uh, control, right? No uh, overlordship. Not even the Etruscans, of course, had cared about expanding the interland, except, of course, the uh, for what the the Etruscan one uh, was, right? In mostly around t today's Tuscany, but also partly in the Po Valley, at least until the, the Celts um, arrived and uh, conquered and Celticized uh, many areas, parts, of course, of, of the further south, the same northern Latium, and especially these coastal reality, which is the one in which, essentially, the more advanced civilizations like the Etruscans, the, the Greeks, had installed themselves in, right? Uh, the as you know, the Alains didn't um, didn't um, expand only from a from a commercial point of view like the Carthaginians did. They had real demographic colonies, but they did settle only on the coasts, right? Uh, there was practically not much of a of a control in, in Italic interland, uh, but you know, few. A few, few tens of miles at best, right? And um, the same goes also for other areas of of the Mediterranean. When you realize, for example, that the the uh, interland warfare was had nothing to do with the, the Atlantic one, concretely, right? The the aristocracies could import some of the finest Atlantic uh, uh, panoplies that were the best that that the world could offer. Uh, at the time, but uh, the nature of local politics and warfare was quite typical and somehow also, in fact, common for um, the European continent as, as we've seen many times, these um, war bands of, um, essentially, of infantrymen mostly uh, equipped with, essentially, a noble shield, um, a spear, slash, and a couple of, of lances, Right, uh, a dagger slash sword or some sort, if they ha had enough resources, uh, properly a helmet, uh, a body armor, and so on, and, and other extras, let's say. But um, in general, they fought all 
in a pretty similar way, right? The best difference that you can identify at this point between the Romans and the Italics stereotype, I mean, the Romans were Italics themselves, but I mean, stereotyping the, the categorical difference is that Rome, of course, was already more ordered in a democratic direction. The Etruscans, similarly, as you know, with the Serbian reform, had oriented the Roman clans towards a more subtle direction. But fundamentally, we're talking about, especially for Rome, before the um, the Battle of the Allia River, the Camillian reform, the Samnite wars, and whenever the, the, the manipular tactics was properly you know, affirmed for the Le- so-called Libyan legion of the in fact late 4th century BC was already outlined as in fact the later one described also by Polybius uh, the, the, the standard tactics were essentially a, a battle line in, in, in a say we can say phalanx fashion as far as what the Greeks thought the phalanx was literally even the Celtic infantry was called by them phalanx in the Carthaginian one it, it's essentially a battle line of heavy infantry. It has nothing to do with the specifics of um, of a of a particular tactical device. The, the etymology is literally a tree log, right, rolling over the enemy and clashing, right, with the usual way with pauses in between, a lot of skirmishing, a lot of that uh, kind of uh, separation between the the youthful. Um, in fact, elastic, um, uh, speedy element that runs back and forth to you know to be tested um, between the battle lines in a very risky way. Then the, the, the more grizzled, um, mature man engaging in a more prolonged uh, fashion in, in hand-to-hand combat with a heavier equipment. Um, there was actually an important degree of equestrian warfare. Uh, Italy had uh, good horses, not excellent horses, but um, it, it was um, particularly uh, keen on um, horsemanship as far as the, the resources allowed. And in the Roman sagas, you observe, of course, the, the Romans, the other Latins, the, the Italians in, engaging r- routinely in, 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 in nightly mounted combat, essentially. And also later on, when we can better document the Saki after the Roman um, conquest, uh, you realize that they had a double um, a mounted contingent compared to the Romans, and that was actually by Polybian times pretty sizable, right? Um, conspicuously large, and eventually towards the late republics, this thing would be entrusted mostly to to non-Italians. Um, so we are looking at at a undistinguished times, as we've seen, the Latin cities were kind of richer overall, but they were also dramatically close to the to the Apennine interland, to uh, these other, uh, in fact, uh, tribes uh, dwelling in them. And the motive of, of the clash between this, this urbanized dimension and the, the mountaineer one is uh, anthropologically definitely a, a factor to take in, into account uh, today. Uh, because, again, after the collapse of the Etruscan hegemony, the tribe, the, the interland tribes would basically start pressuring the coastal plains that in Italy are really a few, actually. I mean, most of the peninsula is crossed by the Apennine, and um, the Latin plain naturally is one of the largest um, uh, on the sea. Um, but there are a few others. We will see that the Oscans would threaten even Apulia, uh, that was in part even Illyrian, in nature, were more sedentary, um, etc. But of, of course, uh, the majority of wealth was concentrated in the West. It's again, see, it was seizing what the Etruscans had left in a way, and not just occupying these areas, but having a problem eventually from there to hold them from further waves coming from the mountains, which is what would trigger actually the first Samnite War, where some Oscans were essentially calling help. Uh, Rome for, for help against other Oscans and similar things. Um, overpopulation has always been a recurring problem for the Italian mountain communities. Uh, we have seen it even in medieval warfare, right? The, the finest condottieri actually came from the, the poorer Apenninic uh, 
uh, areas that were more kind of feudal in uh, in culture and that were even put in communal times at the head of some of the largest armies uh, Europe with dramatic capacities and nurtured in a sort of uh, family curriculum that uh, these um, houses were passing down generation to generation if you think about it easily uh, dating back even to to millennia before given the the the, the places the times um, overpopulation that is arguably even important uh, in the Italian peninsula because of the uh, of the aforementioned orographic characteristics. I mean, Italy was very populated. It was also very rich. Um, but the majority of the resources are accessible from the coasts and concentrated there. But the majority of the population is probably a continental one. Right, one would think Italy in the center of the Mediterranean developed some sort of broader maritime culture just per se, but the, the demographic backbone, historic, especially in these times, of uh, of the Italian peninsula came from the mountains, came from these peoples that had again migrated in the millennia before from essentially central Europe. And that exactly because of of the problems you can't see in, in other in other regions of Europe where there are not enough resources locally that is especially in the mountains you realize that at every uh, uh, demographic uh, exceedance you need to cope with by essentially expansion you can argue this was a bit the deal of the migration era or, or the viking era right so um triggering actually a predatory uh, warlike a dynamic that was threatening the main centers um, close to the coast, right? Not necessarily literally on the coast, like in the case of Rome, it's not uh, a sea city, but definitely uh, close to, uh, in that case, the mouth of, of, of the Tiber, uh, the, uh, the, the presence of port and agricultural uh, resources, the salt mines of Ostia that are important, in fact, also in the Sabine interland. So that role of um, medium, you can not say, that also the cities, of course, had carried out in order to develop in the first place, was always uh, looked upon by the, um, by the italics, like, you know, the, the greatest, uh, um, with the greatest ambition, right, as, as a prey, Right, and the Romans had just from their seven hills uh, grown their political identity in this uh, metus hostilis uh, associational form. Right, that is to defend those positions from the marauding neighbors, even of the same Latin plain. There are beautiful Italic legions explaining the. Um, military migration stemming from the need of warriors to find new pastures. That, of course, was uh, a bit like the, the deal of any kind of semi-nomadic people. And that, however, still w- worked right in some uh, areas uh, of the peninsula. Um, according to the Oscan Legion, all the children born in a year of particular distress were dedicated to the god Mamers, that is the, essentially the, the equivalent of the Latin Mars from Mavors in the Proto Italic, and when adult left the community for new territory. So these people were devoted as uh, sacred sworn war bands that belonged to Mars. Uh, and some of the first um, uh, Latin inscriptions we can find refer actually to these um, to these groups, uh, even in in Rome, right? This is not different from again from what you see even in medieval times when you see even again in in the in the Italian city states the presence of um, sworn oaths of uh, youthful knights that were called after the wolf, after the Arturian legions, and all this stuff that uh, essentially behaved like condottieri. It's, it's basically the same thing, right? We categorize with different names and the different years and so on, but the dynamic was 
brutally the same. Also because, as you know, also from Celtic and Germanic warfare, um, that helped us a lot comparatively to tell also what the Italic reality was um, entailed. Um, probably one of... I mean, you don't want to even know what happened in in those war bands and how it worked. They, they, they would just sacrifice people uh, on a regular basis. They would indoctrinate themselves in the absolute um, faith towards their um, their leader and medium of the divinity provided with the Imperium, right? And great part of the same Roman expansion as a whole uh, in the Imperial mythology and, uh, and properly the, the constitution, right, had to do with this concept. is the rape of the Sabines, these raids in which the early uh, in, in in ancestral Rome the the, the in fact the, the the Latins remembered like seizing exterminating the men uh, uh, deporting the women uh, as a prey choosing the finest one in in a properly genetic sense because you know that Rome was born out of these rapes fundamentally and this was how the, the entire tribal world fundamentally lived like um, in, at the time uh, and that was based on the ruthless of course uh, law that the stronger has to rule on the weaker uh, and uh, that this was a principle of rejuvenating divine power such as the same bands of youth uh, leaving from the, uh, the, the, the the central and southern Italian valleys would have to uh, to prove like by raiding by being you know at, at the command of a specific leader and having fortune or dining the enterprise right and this is the same degree of um, you know unspeakable brutality that you see um, in the devotion towards in fact, the divinity, not just in the famous devotio of the Roman commander uh, for the victory of the entire army and showing the full commitment right? Uh, that the, appears in the Roman sagas, the, the, the Roman hero not being scared of, of sacred fire, being able to put his end in it and uh, just um, either winning or dying. It was said in these archaic times that Roman centurions, in times of of trouble in combat, threw the sacred standards of of uh, of the unit beyond the enemy line. So to say, either you go get them back, or you will die in the enterprise, because they knew that if they had come home uh, without insignia, they they were technically dead, because they had all sworn a, a divine oath, and the only way to fix the thing was to kill them. Right. Um, this is what happened also to the Vestal Virgins protecting uh, the sacred fire in Rome. That there is, um, uh, in fact, a, a burningly um, uh, dramatic uh, understanding of the world. This is this mirrors properly what the cosmic struggle in the Indo-European Evangelion um, really meant, and uh, what we can document about this is very scarce in the sense that uh, as you know the Romans emerged from such a primitive background in such a fast way that we didn't have practically any other people documenting in detail at those very times what we're doing right it's just we're lucky that the same Roman ethnography later achieved this, um, uh, the, this result instead with the Germans, as uh, they are literally documented as a prehistorical people in behaving exactly in the same ways that eventually we, we could keep documenting thanks to literacy and so on for the for the Norse, for other, uh, and later also in other contexts, even around the world, this is what today's anthropology can do. But if you, again, read accurately Roman literature, even for what, say, very distant authors like Levy, uh, or even other, for example, Hellenistic ones at the time of the Roman Empire could do. They, we can understand being not just the same thing, but having that specific meaning that in these sagas is 
a sort of Kenningar in its own. I mean, there are some references, if you read, for example, Dumazil's Camillus, to all the various details in the stories, and even in the later accounts, um, that were detached from that reality, but that everything fit with the astronomical cycles, with very specific um, divine references connected to a specific place that had a specific meaning. And, of course, this requires a very high competence to, um, uh, you know, to appreciate to the fullest. But it's there, right? It's there thanks to, um, of course, mostly comparative studies with the, the Vedic religion, with the Germanic one, uh, the Atlantic one, without which altogether we couldn't actually know so much as we do about um, Indo-European warfare and beyond, but that can help us reconstruct clearly what would happen. Right? The, for example, the aforementioned Oscan legion is very much adulterated in the way it's just, um, it talks about the sacrifice to the god in the sanctuary and so on, but these people were literally devoting the youth to the military as such, right? And um, it's important to stress that Mars is, and Mamers in the Sabellian case, is it's, um, is a very specific product. Let's say in, uh, in, in for example, in the Germanic religion, you, you have O1 in Odin, right? Both Jupiter and Mars, right? Because the wisdom, the, the sacred fury, etc. passes through. The, there are other Odinic hypotheses, of course, as basically the, the entire uh, Azer pantheon is is just an, an emanation of the one, right? And so it was also in Rome, except that what we intend as Mars um, is um, is something more specific, and it has to do, as you can see, in Mars Ultor and in many references, properly to the unleashment of that fury, because at the end of the day, the, the Romans would see as Virtus, actually, and that eventually also detach the term fu fury to especially discuss the the barbaric one they thought as the um, the barbaric one that had not managed to, to tame itself. I made just a, recently a video about that as far as uh, the Romano-Celtic-Germanic religion is, is concerned. Literally entered the warrior and crazed him, made him frenetic. And there are very late references to this, including, for example, the wolf that runs, uh, cheered by the Roman army at the Battle of Centinium, the decisive battle for the dominion over Italy that naturally corresponds to a, you know, easily, like what could be a wolf warrior of some sort, as we can see also from some Etruscan helmet slash masks and how, you know, these this champions would, would clash before battle just to, to prove what this was. And, and we're talking about the early 3rd century BC, just a generation after Rome would be at war against Pyrrhus and the Carthaginians, and th this tells you even uh, that degree of, you know, uh, projectional capability that Rome proved, um, how exalted the Roman were in this predatory mindset. I mean, just think about the eagle, not just as, of course, the, the, the uh, celestial symbol, heavenly symbol par excellence, but the greatest expression of predatory dominance in tradition, right? And surely stemming from what these people back in the day could could think also warfare being like. Because as we'll see now, before um, the the fourth century BC, most of the warfare would occur, but in part even in that one, was still very um, oligarchic in nature. Um, in Latium, when say the the Romans had to. Uh, counter the the Volsci, the the Iqui and so on. Um, very often it was uh, just you you can partly see it uh, still in the senatorial mechanism, I mean, the institutional mechanism of, of the Roman uh, magistracies and so on. It was somehow, um, of course, a shared power where um, certain leaders took an initiative and there was a debate on it. And most, of course, of the 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 test, right? The, the political success derived from the the military success because it equated to have won the the imperium divinely accordingly. So, uh, raiding warfare was very, as a consequence, very frequent even from the Roman side against those peoples. Because uh, at this point, Rome had not even 
properly provided herself with that again um, instrument of systematic military um, subjugation that the the manipular legion as product of a of an establishment right it's not just it's just a a, a mean to an end uh, hand would would build later um, and most of the Roman interest was to protect Latium and thus just expanding uh, uh, the the Roman boundaries beyond it in order to create some buffer areas that would enter in fact in the Italic hinterland um, and fighting also on pretty tough terrain instead of creating some buffer areas that entail this constant it for tat kind of devastation cattle raiding and more and that's where most of what we know as as, as the roman military actually was forged um, so this constant pressure from the mountains up, upon coastal communities explains of course the downward movement of the volski and the aequi that we've seen were it other italic peoples um, from central uh, Italy that began to, to harass the, the southeastern Latin frontier. The same goes for the Samnites uh, on a much bigger scale, right? You know, the Samnites were a confederacy of different tribes fundamentally. Um, the, the ones in the north were kind of more uh, individualistic in a way, and in this sense also less threatening, right? But still annoying enough, right, and dangerous enough, especially as far as Roman politics could extend on them, and these peoples could somehow make leverage on this or that side of the Roman politics, because Rome actually was very conservative in nature. The world conquest was on everyone's horizons, but uh, doing it, you know, is another matter, it takes time, so uh, most oligarchs were just content with asserting more their power internally than, um, say, uh, redeeming the people uh, to in a, in a war of expansion, right, with all its risks and so on. So these are also the years of great clashes in Roman historiography, according to Roman historiography, between the, the patricians, the plebeians, uh, the establishment of, of the uh, consular tribunate which had already opened at this time to the imperial magistracies, to the plebs, which was a huge deal and had been necessary ever since, again, the Etruscan hegemony had uh, vanished and uh, the uh, senatorial clans, as hyper, uh, hyperly, um, you know, repressive and violent, whatever, could not defend the city alone and necessitated of the populace that had developed so much uh, in the so-called Etruscan times and that would essentially provide the filing rank trooper of the future Roman legion as we know it and not just as, as the, the feudal clanic one. It was just, of course, an evolution of the latter but uh, it still entailed conferring power, right, uh, voting right, um, thus the one of bearing arms uh, in the in the system. It, it was already there, right, but it, it was enhanced for the expansionistic needs of Rome that mostly stemmed f initially from the defensive needs against these um, Apenninic populations. Um, a wave of Samnitic invaders in the 5th century had famously seized Capua and Cumae in Campania, so south of Latium, but showing what uh, the Apenninic peoples could, could do as far as essentially seizing the most important uh, coastal centers previously hegemonized by the Etruscans and the Alains, right? Um, as we were saying before, in the following century, these coastal centers would be threatened by further excursions of mountain folk, right? And the, the, it would become the, the prime cause of Rome's first Samnite war. Um, so 
you realize that in Latium there was a bulwark represented by by the Latin alliance herself that also included the Eretniki back in, in the Apennine part, so you can appreciate all the shades here. Um, as we know, the, the Samnites were the, the most powerful of uh, the Roman opponents in Italy, and in fact the only ones in which Rome saw, in part probably because of the sacred rituals that we we highlighted before the Mamertines um, that recalled the, the Romans of their you know ancestral traditions as well. I mean the famous Mamertines in in Sicily that triggered the, the first Punic War were exactly the same. These were sacred war bands that had we on, on school books you, you find it were mercenaries, right? But they, they don't tell you that they had to do with this constant kind of predatory uh, mindset uh, aimed at expanding without any stop. Um, and arguably, Roman expansionism owes much to what she could, in fact, relearn or coming to, to reappreciate on a larger scale um, on the model of uh, the same Samnites uh, that, after their conquest, were also um, employed in Rome in gladiatorial games because of their stunts, uh, their kind of. Uh, uh, Physical, psychophysical performances as warriors in in, in these, um, in fact, movements that even were deeply connected with a kind of connection with the um, with the universal order, and we're exemplifying, I say, to the Roman people, what can a warrior do, right? To um, you know, to, to what can an individual do, but also how greater. Rome was than that already for having subjugated them, right? Uh, Samnitic pressure, as we were saying before, was not limited to the Tyrrhenian seaboard. Levy, for example, tells us how the Oscans also threatened Apulia in the southeast, uh, describing in the Historiae the conflict specifically in terms of the clash between plainsmen and mountain folk. This is naturally an oversimplification, right? It was a topus already dear to ancient ethnography, uh, exactly because it was gravid uh, in properly an anthropological meaning, in, in sacral one, was... Um, a respect for the summoning uh, capacities that the the, the barbarian peoples uh, would mystically accomplish um, from their you know uh, ecstasies, their their uh, shamanic trances, in order to come to, to master that uh, tonic force, right? And the uh, the Conquerors like the Dorians, the Italics, etc., just already believed to, to be superior to that. Um, but um, let's say having gradually also lost touch with that kind of more evenly direct um, practice, and in this sense, the the Apennine heartland still bore much of that legacy, also for the Romans to uh, revitalize. Her imperium, given that again most of her armies in in the in the glory days would be made up of those people, even more than uh, of, of Roman citizens. So this is this is quite quite important as much as the uh, radical civilizational impact that Rome was able to do in order to convince those people to stand with her as it was proven especially during the second punic war when not even the the, the massive bloodbath could make these people think that abandoning rome was, was a good idea and it's the sacred principle there that must be appreciated as rome had proven just because that she was in charge I and mean, she had surpassed even etruscan and german so anything that basically in Italy had ever been established as a as a broader power. At the same time, the shepherd-peasant relation uh, 
played an important role. This is exemplified also in Augustan uh, propaganda by the splendid Virgil Leon work. Um, there is a, in fact, uh, a symbology there between the complementary nature of the Apollonian and of the Dionysian, of the Uranian and of the Chthonic, that can be switched in a way, which were the civilized people, which were the barbarians, right? And um, what does it take to take over, in fact, and succeed, right? From drawing from both of the of, of the background. And the, of course, the Romano-Italic Confederacy as the heartland of the Roman Empire itself um, would would prove right to be able to to master that ideology around which in fact revolves still what we, we should understand is what we think we have invented in modernity but it wasn't at all right it, it is traditional and it has to do with the broader power deriving from high standards for for everyone involved in a constant competition over which the ruler has to um, maintain the same degree of, of control that his authority is worth, right? And so hardly just a mechanistic um, or nihilistic idea that everyone has to be free even if they, they don't have a worth um, or a purpose, right? The idea of, of the Roman citizenship and military service was all one with the idea of having earned that because you had primarily a duty towards God, right? So hardly anything that today we fished back by claiming that, no, it's just because we had to base everything on something non-transcendental uh, like human standards. It, it would collapse, obviously, right? And interestingly enough, there is no country in the world today that uh, has that uh, idea anymore. Right, um, and it's interesting how kind of the mass roots for the peoples that the most were deprived of religion, properly of tradition, uh, of um, any human standard, even over time with the most ferocious communistic uh, regimes, rather than seeing that the superiority of Western civilization l lays, of course, in the very heart of of, of the same of the same West and, it, and of what it was able to accomplish, in case you didn't notice. Well, um, erasing, or at least inverting, because you can't do that by cancelling, um, also because nothing can be really, uh, you know, turned back as it was before, fullest, uh, but just inverting the paradigm there, that in the last two or three hundred years, essentially, we have been fed with shamelessly, <laughs> Right, pretending that science is just materialism and or something that you can physically measure and the rest not understanding so eliminating any uh, transcendental awareness is, is somehow scary right but very scary um, and not if these people had knew had none of that they, they would have had what the hell is that are you crazy or out of your mind well yes we are crazy and out of our minds because never mind Human standards are disgusting and they are sinking. Well, uh, maybe, you know, it's just how we are. Don't worry, it's normal. You know, everything that happens to you, it's normal. Don't, don't, don't worry too much, you know. it's You, you can't change things. Don't, don't think about it. Yeah, because, you know, as if the entire history of civilization didn't show the diametrical opposite of it. Well, in any case... Uh, when we look at Livy's account, we are surely ap appreciating, however, the difference that did exist um, between the mountain and plain cultures. Um, there is, um, of course, uh, an anthropological stereotype that identifies in the mountain dweller apt to be the laughing stock of the superior inhabitants of the plain, um, this role of um, um, suspected, feared, and mocked uh, fellow that you may never know what, what he's up to, right? And the obvious reason deriving from it's a bit the 
uh, the, of course, it expresses a more backward reality where, again, these peoples were more unstable fundamentally than they needed uh, to, to expand, essentially out of despera desperation, right? And in, in order to survive by some degree, but mostly because um, they realized that their same intrinsic mechanisms brought them that amount of power that they had to wield in a word and another, um, and that eventually get tamed by the more rational, uh, disciplined, and uh, authoritative element of, of the plane that has learned how to rule over a more developed world and thus has de facto more power, right? But acts through essentially the, the superiority of the elite and just at best the redeeming value of the people that is used to, to defend uh, that uh, that civilization, right? So this is particularly important because it's basically what the West has kind of always done, right? It, it doesn't stem just, of course, from the mythologies of all of all Indo-European peoples in particular, but um, from the obvious realization that if you have power, uh, it's useless to let it stay there, right? Without without using it. Right. You have a possibility of growing and expanding and learning and giving a chance to exactly that element that as uh, stagnating as it seems in the form of the people can be um, instead uh, transfigured right? as the Roman uh, citizenry would be. Right? The idea that th this very barbarians could be elevated to the rank of the conquerors in virtue of those, in fact, qualities that, from one side, were, in fact, the same virtus, but that, if adequately, adequately disciplined in an Apollonian sense, could literally match the, the universal standard, and in this case, conquering the world, right? Uh, it goes without saying that the matter was resolved pretty violently, Right. Uh, the other day, I of course was uh, stressing the uh, as as I always do because you cannot win otherwise in terms of um, of moral support by convincing, in fact, these communities to cooperate with Rome, right? As opposed to being just wiped out, right? If the Romans had been conquering the world just by killing people, um, uh, you know, there would have not been an empire, right? or nobody to rule over. Um, it, it was a matter of proving to be superior. In the, in the moment in which somebody lays his arms down, it's done, right? You can He can whine and complain about, oh, you know, they came to rule over us, but then why? If you, gave, if you gave so much value to your liberty, why didn't you stand your ground? Or even prefer to die in the process, right? So... This is valid, of course, for most human standards already at the time. They saw that, after all, the Romans were, in relative terms, better than them, right? And consequently, also in absolute want, given the, the broader hierarchy and scale of accomplishment and what this meant, essentially, for the globe um, till to this day. So um, it's difficult to... Um, to describe, of course, what this could take shape like in in the 5th or in the 4th century BC. Um, they were brutal clashes, right? Lots of people were massacred. But, I mean, in, in, in a scale that even though was not uh, sufficient to significantly deplete the Italian demographics, because at that time it was literally booming, it naturally brought to a dramatic attrition out of which, again, you can see the Roman military being born, as w the, the one as we know it, properly the legion, right? Before this, the, the concept of legio is, at least we, we come to know it just in, in the consular phase when, you know, it was properly a, a picking up the individuals who had to be part of the group, but this existed still in, in, uh, already in warband times, in clanic times, right? And those same, uh, you know, practice as of uh, of the of the ver sacrum were 
replicated everywhere, right? Not just in the mountains, but also in in the Roman Forum, and they 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 had to do with a pretty severe test that uh, the Campus Martius was, in fact, established for. If you think about that, because we see this in all in an Apollonian way, adulterated from blood and guts and all this stuff, but. I mean, the Romans had the Tarpeian rock. When two weak kids were born, they literally threw them off the cliff. Um, and there is still in Rome, and when you pass by there, nobody nobody knows, right? Because you know, you go to Rome normally, what the average person does, it's just to take selfies in front of the Colosseum uh, or the Trevi Fountain. But what, what... I have nothing against that, by the way. I think Trevi Fountain is my favorite spot in Rome, aside from the... the, uh, the, the in an aesthetical sense, aside from the sacred um, issues. But the, the, the concept to me is, uh, of course, why don't we acknowledge what that sustratum really was? Of course, because we are disgusting, uh, technologistic bastards that think that, you know, uh, whatever is big and, you know... Uh, just visible and old without any other datum is wow well, 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 well they were so advanced and whatever but do you do you even know why did they get there do you know that you shouldn't see roman civilization in function of things like the colosseum but if anything the other way around that is to say the Colosseum is just the consequence of something that happened, of, of a propulsion force. It's like saying, oh, look at the stars, and you don't know that it was a Big Bang, right? And, and, and it's that Big Bang that is also the single most difficult thing to understand because you don't know exactly what caused it, right? Uh, you don't know why, in this case, Rome accomplished what it did if you just make it, uh, in fact, a materialistic story. Right, and that's why I began to talk about archaic Rome in the in the, in the essentially religious, um, transcendental, metaphysical terms that it deserves. Because it's not just that they believed that, but the the entire world believed it. Um, uh, not just for eventually what Rome would become, because everybody was literally awaiting for it. Right, that evangelic tension that. Um, you can find in, in, in Christianity that, again, not surprisingly, was born, literally, uh, under Augustus, um, in a metaphysical sense. But that was proper of the succession of, of the various eras. And in the prophecies that had talked about the representation of the Golden Age for, for a brief time, between the Bronze and the, the Iron One, um, and, and more, right? So, reflect on the archetypal essence, at least, that existed, even, in fact, behind, in this case, Roman warfare, and which were, in fact, the roots that that system was the, the expression of, right? So, when the Volsci and the Aequi began to harass Latium, of course, Rome and her allies began to lose an important amount of land, too, and resources. We have seen that the, that the Volsci were the kind of bit the, the more aggressive because they, they arrived like at the outskirts of Latium in the south, on the Pontine Plain, and so on the coast, by the way, and they were pretty aggressive, like the Romans uh, highlight the fact that they were constantly... Um, turbulent, you know, where and are. Maybe also to, to their own detriment, because eventually that equated some sort of political instability. But they were able to launch raids uh, on the same Rome, which is pretty upsetting, right? And now with the legion of Coriolanus, we will also explain what they probably triggered um, unbeknownst of themselves, or maybe actually um knowing that and counting that Rome would have not succeeded in it and actually triggered that hell of a f nuclear fission, we can say. Mm -hmm. The we were less powerful. They dwelt actually a bit more in the north, um, so in the east of Latium. Uh, 
rather than in the south, and they mostly arrest the uh, the Latin allies of Rome, uh, which was naturally more projected towards the the Tiber mouth, the the sea, and, and dealt more with, with the Volsci. Um, the uh, Iquan lands were naturally the uh, the pathway to further Italian interland, right? And thus that continental dimension, which probably put an impressive amount of strains, right? This was evident also during this, uh, the, the invasion of Samnium, the, even some mutinies that occurred in the Roman army, because the, the land was so terrifying that uh, just a Roman will there was to bend not just the enemy, but also the, the resistance within the same Rome, for that matter. Because literally they had to conquer castle after castle, valley after valley, with guerrilla, with um, extreme, again, um, heights, um, d differences, all, all this kind. And that's arguably the, 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 uh, the theater in which the Roman army was more concretely forged, uh, as opposed to just then kind of the easier... Uh, plain areas that more or less can be hegemonized just even by political influence before just uh, bringing boots on, on the ground, right? Uh, there you have literally to to eat that ground in order to take it, and it and it's and it's tough, really tough. Um, as we were saying before, uh, these raids in Roman and Latin territory were as frequent as disruptive. And not just from a material point of view, but because it was highlighting essentially that um, without a sole or at least a hegemonic uh, rule over the same Latium, uh, the region was exposed, but it was, was weak and uh, was permeable to further rights, so in incentivating, encouraging further incursions. This is what, in perspective, brought the Romans also to affirm, as they were just by the, the most important growing Latin center to fundamentally Germanize them in turn, but that would take um, the so-called Latin wars that had historically just been fought. You know that Rome at some point was under Alba Longa. There was a, a broader Latin um, identity revolving the sanctuary of, of Jupiter, on the um, on the Alban hills and so on, um, and later would bring even the same some knights to fight alongside the Romans against the Latins, um, just once, right, arguably. But I made a video about the Battle of Suez that, that explains that. Um, so this situation uh, required, for obvious reasons, um, an enhanced leadership and unitary uh, policy to deal militarily uh, with. And so the wars of the 5th century began, as it's fair to say, as a struggle for survival, right? Um, these Latin centers were powerful, but again, divided. Uh, and this, in spite of their resources, Brought, her, uh, brought them under considerable pressure from these mountaineers that were also, again, not just uh, primitives from, from caves. They had an important military power and organization, and even if the Latins were, were better, they, they still had to find a solution to who was to rule over the entire Latium in order to cope with, with a problem. Right? And the episode of Coriolanus, that, as you know, was a a Roman patrician who essentially uh, switched side to the Volsci because he had been mm, exiled for, from the same Rome uh, is quite uh, eloquent. He came to besiege Rome, or at least to arrive uh, at its outskirts in, during these raids. And what is fascinating is the political background mostly, because why was Coriolanus uh, exiled from Rome? Um, Cnaeus Marcus Coriolanus. Coriolanus is a cognomen that he took after the victory he scored 
on the Volscan center of Corioli. Uh, hence, he was actually one of the finest Roman patricians from the hard radical conservative side that was capable of this magnificent military stunt, so uh, to Roman hero in, in the story. It, however, um, gets in the way the destiny of Rome in many ways, because he was essentially against the protraction of the uh, consular tribunate. Um, there had been some debates on how to distribute the grain that Rome had started to import, import from, from Sicily. As far as especially the uh, distribution to the plebs was concerned, the plebs had been had demonstrated to be powerful. They had at some point already occupied um, a Roman hill, uh, seceding fundamentally from the senatorial government. So there was a bitter struggle there occurring, and Coriolanus refused to support the plebs in any way, which triggered this um, uh, the, the reaction that the, 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 there are different versions of, of the story, but in, to make the long story short, Coriolanus was exiled, and he decides to go where? To go among the Volsci. And from them to attack the same Rome. So the story goes that eventually he's intended by the side of his uh, wife and and children, begging him at the camp. And the the story seems to be a tonic myth in a way because he is there kind of struck by a female deity that was connected with this kind of important fact Pelasgian Sostratum in the Roman um, in the Roman world um, and he desists from the attack on Rome and the story goes that he was either killed by the Volsci because he had basically betrayed them at that point in turn etc but the important thing being actually that in this myth um, where you see that there was a strange situation between the patricians and the plebeians and so this also great international pressure, where the Rome had to take the next step, to take literally the lead in here. The point was, as it would happen with the chameleon reform later on, um, essentially co-opting the plebs to field those numbers that were necessary, also for the senatorial clans to successfully wage war against the enemy. And so extending... Uh, Roman power as a whole using the plebeian resources that as far as men and material were concerned were pretty impressive and thus also establishing fundamentally a, a permanent professional army that would surpass seasonalism that would have enough resources to in fact to go uh, far out far away right for, for long periods of time and to therefore subjugate a much greater amounts of people and land, right? And so the aforementioned genesis of the chameleon slash Libyan, whatever you want to call, army of, of some kind, right? So in this myth, uh, the, the morals stand in the fact that there is no victory in a merely, um, not necessarily just merely a Polonian, Right uh, direction, but in the f- so that just like like patricians ruling alone, right, but remaining sterile because they would basically deprive Rome of her also somatic power. But the, the traditional view, of course, requires the the Apollonian element to succeed as such, or at least for individuals to actually achieve that super power of Apollonian nature only through the disciplining the control, the subjugation of the chthonic element, right, that would be transfigured in turn, right, just like the, the Furies, etc., that transform themselves in Victoria herself, and thus the same messenger of divine glory that would bring the hero to heaven, and in this case, Rome to the world conquest. So th- this is amazing because Coriolanus' legion takes place in the 5th century, so it's uh, like, as you know, we have just history slash myth for that time. But the actual meaning is pretty eloquent. 
right row hand again to step further into uh, a ruthless and systematically conquering machine by evoking and taming the deepest forces of her nature naturally being able to dominate them right as the Roman system eventually broke to the full integration of the plebeians in, in the government. Seen in this perspective, you realize that uh, also the, the following military accomplishments of Rome derived from um, sort of defensive need, primarily. Right? So a prehensive um, strategy which was to free, first of all, Latium from a condition where, again, the, the, the local had lost the initiative, actually, on others, reverting that and conquering, right, ruling over the same people that had pressured them. And this was successful as, as the century progressed, the Latin allies gradually recovered much of their land and uh, took it to a length that was unprecedented in especially the Roman history, right? Considering that it had emerged just as one of the Latin centers and now was had risen to, to a Germany. If the Volsci and the Aequi had kept being there, uh, the problem would have just been postponed, right? Uh, there is no room in world domination for someone else's uh, independence, right? Uh, you have, again, to, to subjugate them by giving them a reason uh, for for staying under you and thus also providing them in return a sort of autonomy that at that point is given by the conqueror, right, that has already proven that he, he wants can simply um, defeat you, right, and thus this redemptional manumissio of the defeated that is arisen practically as almost at the same level of the conquerors to, to, uh, eventually also achieved that at some point, being all one in that full uh, acknowledged unity of intent, right, is one of the greatest, uh, if not the greatest in relative terms at least, uh, practical mean of Roman success, right? When other peoples were not so um, far-sighted, right, they would just content themselves of uh, affirming kind of an absolute power without any realization of the resources that could be um, employed uh, otherwise. And that's what in, in domestic policy the same episode of Coriolanus is meant to um, to highlight without being too greedy, right? Uh, one of the most important virtues of the, of the uh, Roman... Uh, Patris was liberality as far as especially the the redistribution of resources as a true chieftain, right? As also the, the the leaders of those aforementioned war bands were used to do. You cannot have a strong um, military if you don't uh, give them trust, if you don't give them the means, if you if you don't believe in them. Uh, if to you these are people that are just going to potentially stab you, right? Then that's because you've been too greedy, and that this is completely incompatible with the Roman mentality, right? The uh, Samnite wars are the same mechanism on, on a larger scale. The, the Samnites were arguably tougher. To, to subjugate, right? Even though Rome was essentially fighting also against other peoples uh, at a time that coordinated their force with the Samnitic ones and the um, 
uh, the the Roman hegemony was not affirmed until the Battle of Centinium. There, there were other times before in which Rome could simply not make it, right? Um, and uh, during the Samnitic Wars, Rome was essentially uh, and strike forwardly, hitting at the uh, the Schwerpunkt actually of the Italic people, right? Because breaking the Samnites meant de facto to control all the Apenninic interland, uh, even just uh, indirectly, right? Because there was no other people that could uh, thwart Roman expansion in Italy but the Samnites. And no, and nobody could hope to do it without them, right? That's why they, they rebelled, for example, during the, the, the Second Punic War as well, and they gave kind of head Hagus to, to Rome until the social war, but with, with the other people in, in Italy was easier, right? It's also meaningful that the Samnite Wars began just after the Romans had conquered the Volsci, right? So the the idea that by that point um, the Romans had acquired an unawareness of their potential and their power uh, and how much they could wield it against um, the, the neighboring peoples was uh, achieved, right? It stemmed from a desperate struggle, right? So the moment of crisis, Metosostilis, right? And a process of um, hegemonization of Latium carried out by the Romans that um, had taken, in fact, on this kind of already civilizational character. The idea is that you are the large power that has to tame um, lesser peoples who do not understand the uh, sacred standards by which you are abiding. And the Romans probably were already at this point uh, convinced that this expansion would have taken them very far. Right in, in theological terms, of course, you can never look at, at the political process by just uh, pretending that this was a unitary conviction or that you know it was even thought on how to to accomplish uh, certain uh, results that would have occurred just even in the following generations. But the awareness of the possibility of taking this far through that uh, magic, um, say, recipe that we have spiritually and sacredly outlined, where it was, was beginning really to open the Roman eyes to, to a degree that would be unrepeated and that we can argue the West has walked in the footsteps of in, in any achievement of this while relating to the same Roman past and, and the transcendental standard that have been set there. At this point, reconstructing warfare, we will do it by by some degree, of course, but it, it, it's not entirely uh, possible in detail. Of course, we have several accounts of the various campaigns that um, archaic Rome carried out. We can study them also comparatively, uh, with other people knowing, also knowing the places, understanding these deeper political implications that I find it the more more, more interesting, right? But it, it's clear that the passage from a more fragmented um, clanic reality to a to a more compact statal direction uh, is uh, is clear, right? Uh, it was still again not. Uh, uh, Categorically divisible, divisible, but it uh, definitely stems exactly from the the balance between the two elements, right? A shared power of the patrician oligarchy over the military command, fundamentally co-opting also plebeian elements, thus mobilizing the imposing clientels that patricians and plebeians made up uh, together, right? 
as a consequence, we can highlight that most of throughout most of this period and before uh, chameleon times specifically, m most of Roman warfare was basically raiding, right? It was not already systematic, at least until the end of the 5th century, according to the traditional chronology, there is no such thing like um, uh, a permanent pay for the legionnaire uh, on campaign. There is uh, essentially a, an episodic nature also of some engagements, some that would just occur almost by chance, right? The, the Romans were again invading areas that were even more fragmented uh, than, than Latium, and that uh, therefore overlapped different uh, layers of kind of uh, uh, tribal, kind of ethnic, political uh, affiliations that could change and that would react also uh, against Rome. In fact, uh, the Capitoline conquests uh, compacted the Italics by an unprecedented degree as well. And as we were saying before, these peoples didn't essentially fight differently from, from the Romans. Right, they were just more preferably, but for strategic reasons, not because they, they wouldn't know how to, to tactically fight uh, had they had an advantage. In fact, you know, most of preferring skirmishers, guerrilla ambushes uh, to uh, pitch battle, open field engagements, large deployment of forces. Um, and the, the Romans were involved too in, in all these you know, scouting, raiding, uh, looting uh, operations that confronted that with, with a need also, not just of employing local troops, but developing the civilizational tools to, to frame them in a more advanced military system that would come to be essentially at the end of this great uh, gestational phase and uh, eventually the, the conquest of all Italy, the so-called Polybian Legion. So that stage of the Manipular Legion was in fact mature enough to uh, be employed even outside of Italy and um, with a level of collective training that could top the uh, the greatest tactical accomplishments of all times, namely the, the Annibalic ones, right? Uh, so the implications of this is, is enormous, right? Because as we've noticed also in the other video, even just the, the timeline of the Roman conquest of Italy is extremely um, brief. I mean, the, the, the rise to hegemony in the peninsula was a matter of, let's say, from a Latin background, something like 70 years, right? Um, and this... Um, cannot be explained but through an astonishing moral uh, success due mostly to those qualities that the Romans also in later times believed to be um, rigidly right uh, mm. brutally and, and also um, coldly actually their, their greatest accomplishment in, a, in an Apollonian fashion authority, reason, discipline Always being aware, however, that this stemmed from a, essentially from a, from a genetic base, from a, um, from a traditional value and the virtus uh, obtainable only when entering in harmony with the sacred, right? Hence, also the mamertine devotion, the sense that you could not uh, undertake any enterprise without maintaining an, essentially an ascetic stand in the political, military and social management because that's when the thing gets more difficult to handle and that principle of self-development derives exactly not from a um, denial of the world like you see today that uh, the mo allegedly say the, the most allegedly traditionalist element the, you know, self-citizened, actually, traditional elements are for, no, no, we have to escape into nature, we have to fight technology, all this thing. Like, uh, you have to be able to master them, to rule over the world. 
not being a, a, a nuclear fort estate or uh, that claims to live in the woods with you know just all the, the modern technology and uh, makes videos on YouTube about that, right? That that's actually the expression of, of the most deeply rooted moral, cultural, and personal inferiority that you can express in absolute terms. It's probably the failure, the denial uh, of any form of individual quality, traceable one, uh, by divine standards. And it's just an insult to the dignity of the minimal human intelligence. Um, so the capacity here to appreciate the the issue is even is even greater in the Roman case because the Italic peoples once they had settled um, from wherever they came uh, in Central Europe they they had undergone a decline like all the conquerors that basically moved everywhere this is the uh, the the dichotomy you can argue but, taking place uh, dynamically in the history of mankind and uh, you know, acquiring in the process that those Pelasgian influences, the great civilization of the modern lunar cults, the Luric ones, is even uh, among, for example, the Etruscan influence that was dramatically dark in that sense. Even the Sabines, who were an Italic Indo European people, had already absorbed some of those lunar tendencies and so on. The most ancient um, Roman calendar itself is lunar. There, there are, as we were saying before, many tonic elements, and of course, are necessary in of themselves to achieve divine transfiguration, but that m must be m mastered, in fact, by a Uranic principle. What Rome did was to shift the, the mechanism, again, repristinating a golden age between a bronze and an iron one in the world, right, with a universal empire, and, in fact, still maintaining in the West the the, the dominance of that principle, having literally inverted it, while the world at the time was already leaning towards the um, the Dionysian dimension, right? And we are going down again because, of course, everything must be revived, right? There is no deterministic cyclicality in here. It's a struggle against, if you want, um, the second principle of thermodynamics. It's um, uh, of course, well recognized by all the mythologies, we are going down, but there is still a salvific possibility in the action of man, not in a superstitious, um, you know, wishful thinking. Um, and that's what the Romans understood. And this is what their su success is primarily attributed to both two, because no other material advantage, exposure to other people would have actually made it just per se. If they had simply said, no, we, we can't do this, right? We don't want to do this, or we don't want to accept that we have to improve ourselves, like Coriolanus thought, and, and that he paid for eventually, right? This is always the thing. The all the superior cultures in the history of mankind were in between tradition and modernity. All of them, because they had the very best of both in moments of crisis. Rome is the greatest example of this, in absolute terms. And it's this is the true meaning of any Roman history lesson that you can draw. It's not about everything, again, you can hear here, except this thing. It's about multiculturalism or, you know, it's, it's material issues, it's how people were rich or not or whatever. The Romans created this thing. Again, it, it didn't happen overnight. Um, it's a gradual process, but there is no doubt in, bro in the broader scale of things that it went in the radically opposite direction that the entire world was going and is still going. Right, to a degree that no other power ever accomplished. And you can't explain this in other ways, also given that their, enti their entire ideology revolved around this, as we well know from imperial times and even the same ones. Um, so, um, 
the, again the predatory aspect of it that is well evident even in the sense of the uh, you can see it on the Arapakis after um, Actium the, the idea that uh, essentially the, the northern power arrives to, to subjugate the, the southern one that the, there are these migratory birds um, G's that are sacred also to Yuna and to uh, this rejuvenating idea of the in fact the uh, uh, the divine wisdom that is also in fact the female figure that is um, to complete the divine male uh, as a standard that the warrior always pursues and that is a bit like the concept of the, the rape of the Sabbath by the way um, um, and that speaks of of a full man-like accomplishment through the subjugation of the weaker but also of the protection and the nurturing capacity of the same to a standard through a incredibly delicate balance between brutality and compassion uh, with the the former one having always to prevail because there, there can't be you you just know that things are going to uh, to to degrade anyway in the other direction by themselves Right? And the only way to keep that up is maintaining the sacred fire lit and to keep burning right, your resources, keeping increasing them. Because without that, without that self-sacrifice, you cannot accomplish the ultimate power that is spiritual in nature. And is the only one that can regenerate the force. Which is the reason why Rome wouldn't stop conquering for half of a millennium. And after that had to rule an empire, that the resources required for were, were huge. And the, the thing kept staying for, for other centuries intact, right? Um, and survived undeterminately. Because, again, it's not just the kind of very modernistic view we decided to observe the Middle Ages like. But just the same name of things like the Holy Roman Empire should make you ring some, some bell there. But why? such a name was chosen, right? I think it was just a kind of fashionable name. Uh, I made lots of videos about the Renovatio Imperi, and we somehow treat the Middle Ages as the fair of, of ethno-nationalism, when it was actually, you know, uh, one of the most radically imperially traditionalistic uh, moments in the history of mankind, as far as probably the awareness by other peoples that had understood the same thing, that not just that was the way, but that Rome had been the way, and for which that name had been maintained, right? Um, as we were saying at the beginning of the video, of course, the warfare in involving the, the, the Romans, the, uh, the other Italics, etc., was, say, relatively primitive at this point. We will treat it better in, in other details. I recently made a video about 4th century BC um, Italic um, spears and javelins to explain also the development uh, of the pilum as a matter of fact as a heavy javelin that however was um, as uh, say the, the, in this scale the pretty standard weapon out there uh, among many populations um, and I will not enter in apological uh, questions because otherwise it will start being even more uh, you know, rambling than, than I actually am, but just for saying, you know, there there are people who actually believe that Rome conquered the world because they had the Gladius, the Scutum, and the Pilum, and that these were somehow also stuff that were taken by other people. So, and, um, I think um, there is such a, a disorientation on these terms by both form and substance that it's difficult to methodologically and dialectically address them without insulting someone in the process because <laughs> um, um, all right I will skip this again and because it's about the difference between absolute and relative right if one starts conversations without accepting that fundamental difference it, it's useless because you can make basically a person saying whatever they want without any any critical thinking Right, and that's the, the actual the actual issue. People hear something that sounds like what they think to know, and they have to say something about to, to feel um, 
conf convalidated in the process and that's just a proof of kind of of, of the shortcoming of the individual characterly per se um, it's interesting as we were saying before that most of these early campaigns are described also by the later sources as raids right and it, would, it couldn't be otherwise I mean it was full of, of livestock out there um, as we've seen also there were you know, large agricultural resources so most of these wars were based as always on kind of uh, scorched earth um, uh, large scale destructions deportations things like these so it was important because some hotbeds of revolt were not possible to er eradicate otherwise right and the 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 aforementioned Versagram mentality made these people extremely resilient because if you are part of a group that routinely sends out the youths living in, in the wilderness um, starting to live like like uh, warrior beasts and uh, starting to, to, to massacre anyone along the way well of course they can easily entrench somewhere on, on mountain tops on in forests in places that they are very difficult to dislodge from and that's where the humble uh, Roman uh, Latin legionnaire had to find his way through, right? Which is um, what wouldn't make him humble otherwise. It's you know, pretty bloodthirsty as, as much as those who were from the other side. But it's that frightening realization, in a way, that was attracting them. And it was um, making them realize that you cannot break the circuit of your... Um, of your um, contingental existence if you don't uh, in fact transcend what uh, even you know, mortality really is and that's why again these warriors devoted themselves uh, in these enterprises and while everything revolved around the, the, pr the ultimate principle embodied by the, the insignia and the ultimate uh, of course, spirit that lived um, both morally and materially, because as you know, there were essentially two ghosts. Uh, in, in, in one, one would hopefully um, be part of, of an apotheosis. The, the 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 last was the one of of the Gens. Uh, it ran in your blood. It's the same reason why you had, say, Celtic uh, warriors venerating mounds over the, the, the tombs of the of the fallen warriors, because, you know, aside from the ambiguity of what, what, what this warrior had accomplished, if his body was still there, that's another thing. Romulus disappears entirely instead in the Campus Martius in, in, a, in a cloud, right? Um, the, the belief is that there was a, a sort of spirit belonging to your family or people, uh, it was also a bit a uh, demonic force, the spirit of the world at, at the larger uh, scale that you could draw that you must summon in order to tame um, and to project forward and transfiguring together with right physically uh, physically like with body and soul combined um, so this is just for seeing how viciously apostatic gnosticism is. Right, and why, of course, all the French, uh, what, what are actually materialists, they don't know that. They reject matter, but they are de facto, for, per se, they, they haven't understood anything about the game, nor the fact that they're communists, practically, but that's another issue. But it's literally the history of mankind. And again, if, if we remembered anything of these ancestral meanings, we would have a much clearer life, uh, as a matter of fact. Um, when we read Levi and uh, Dionysus of Alicarnaxus, um, we, of course, uh, mostly know the Roman side of the story, which uh, wasn't a conspiracy theory, as also most people that cannot accept what the Romans accomplished for some um, uh, nationalistic or socialistic, that is, postmodern reason, think. Um, we have to appreciate uh, the side of the most advanced uh, people of course um, we realize that consuls and dictators take 
uh, you know, control of, of the military expedition. There was all a system for which, in fact, there was already a, essentially a startled treasure that was put in part of disposal of these commanders. There is already a, a first, um, as we will see now, the siege of Bay. Um, permanent nature, like the the, the armament of, of the troops would be in part, of course, derived, especially as far as the, the, the larger uh, communities was involved, part of a, of course, a more centralized um, uh, organization, right? You don't have to imagine that the Roman peasant literally going out there with his, his bare arms, right? And even in very archaic times, not being um, supplied with some other, if, if anything, just food or other, but it, they, they couldn't bring all themselves, it would have been terribly irrational and, and illogical. Um, and this boosted further uh, the, um, the system, because it's exactly the predatory raiding nature of Roman warfare that at the end of the day tended to accumulate those resources, right? Even if, say, during the, the 5th century, Rome did little more than plunder in that regard to still um, in fact succeed in in subjugating uh, the enemy uh, this was in fact the, the only scale of warfare that was significantly enactable with the nascent subtle system existing at the time uh, it's also of course obvious that when we read uh, Levy and especially in the early books, um, such details stem from authentic information. So from a knowledge that unfortunately we, we, we don't know. I mean, some sources we know from Livy, but also these were part of broader traditions that echoed in the Roman uh, culture, coming from, from authoritative sources, um, but mostly from those times orally. Right and more, so it's a bit. That's why I call them the sagas, by the way, because they literally were that, and the Romans wouldn't. I mean, they 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 were literate, especially in the pop, par paradoxical in the popular element. Of course, also the patricians presumably knew, were acquainted with that, but they they wouldn't write themselves until, I mean, literature proper until the third century, BC. Right, you know, some, again, uh, you know, epigraphy. Mm -hmm some documents, uh, other things, yeah, of course. But probably a literary taste that could produce a Roman historiography that would still, however, remain significantly influenced by external models even when it was fully developed in sometimes very beautiful ways um, is not what, of course, it, it doesn't bring us the, the actual voice of, of, of Romans in the, in the 5th century BC. Um, for which we have to be quite careful. Uh, the 4th century brought, however, with significant changes. According to the chronological tradition, at the siege of, of, of Bay that lasted for a long time in a significant distance from Rome, the legionnaires are said to have been, for the first time, paid. Right, mostly nature or in gods or of, of some precious metal and, and both, as a matter of fact. Um, so way before Marius, uh, and this entails some sort of, um, you know, also central organization as far as, as we've seen logistic supplies was concerned. Um, it was still a very primitively brutal and archaic uh, time, but that's where we can observe the establishment of the permanent military that we know with the chameleon reforms and all. It's a complicated period, but we'll have to look at it in, in detail under other aspects because we have to talk about the, the Battle of the Alia River, the Gallic Sack, and, and more. Uh, yet, and this is the thing that anthropologically should should really make you think about the Romans, that in spite of this modernity, after all, that had achieved, the, the Roman memory is, is still obsessed with booty, 
right? And, and this would go uh, on for, for quite a while, even t throughout the entire Republican era. Um, the idea is that Rome was thinking of herself ideologically as that eagle flying again on the um, on the preys and essentially managing to 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 catch them to to uh, to stall them from from the from the dirt from what they the were hiding right and nurturing herself in her um, celestial splendor. Um, and this is properly the idea, I'll come and get you in your own nest, right? And I will devour you. Um, and this is frightening, right? Even just cognitively, we th say Rome, and generally speaking, aside from personal sympathies, uh, people associate, I think, I think light to Rome. Um, and so a sort of positive um, bias as far as properly the emotions are concerned, like um, the idea that this would eventually, again, as we were saying before, bring to, I don't know, aqueducts and, and roads and stuff. But when you realize that this was a systematically subjugating machine, you have to, first of all, think of what the others would think of Rome, and especially the fear that she was able to strike in order to succeed, right? Because it was, as we were saying before, there is essentially no difference between Again, and this is the, the beauty in which you can properly substantiate what power means, also in a transcendental sense, between conviction and fear, which is the same concept of fate and, 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 and fear that you, that you have towards God, right? Because exactly for topping the universal standards, Rome entailed either eternal love or eternal wrath, right? And so fr from the outcome, of a clash against Rome, the divine judgment would stem, right? And this was gradually affirmed as Rome was objectively taking over everything. And so people began to say, but what is this? Because the ancients uh, literally uh, were quite aware of this, and so they, they were always measuring each other's standards also to keep them fit. And if a power of this nature and of this background could rise so suddenly, so quickly and successfully, something had to be behind that in any case, right? So the unstoppability, this is, of course, like when Polybius says we, we, at the beginning of his work, we're so dumb fundamentally to, to ignore the, the reasons why Rome came to power the way she did, right? In such a short time, right? So we are also leaving, of course, in, in the wake of that, um, narrative, but uh, the accomplishment is real, so it's hardly, you know, mitigatable, right? It, it's not a matter of perspective. This power, as large as a, as a, as a city of a, a fifth century Latin, managed to, to take over in, again uh, half of a millennium. Essentially most of Europe in the misery. And, and this thing is, um, uh, by a standard uh, that we cannot compare, of course, for, for later empires, because they had different means and not necessarily a greater, uh, you know, spiritual commitment per se. So the, the question is, is what what is the other power on earth that could compare with with this one, uh, concretely, in relative terms, it, it, you will not find it. There would be uh, some kind of reservation, of course, for, for empires that emerged in a similar way, but that eventually wouldn't last. That's yet another thing that, uh, you know, they, they as, as soon as they picked the, the Mongol Empire, right, even if was again a different context it's obvious that the premises were necessary to make it crumble in one or another and it, you know what what kind of basis can you establish in the steps just to maintain greater civilizations right rome in this sense is the is the story of a power that managed to emerge yes from a 
a hybrid background, which is always, again, the most important. Uh, there are many other examples of this in history we can also cover, but that essentially became self-aware of the uh, decadence of mankind. Um, starting from a decayed reality, right? So not from simply the spring of the of the ultimate um, warrior background. It was also the one that couldn't even rule over, in fact, the, the most civilized areas. But of an empire that essentially emerged from an hybrid of that kind and managed to 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 civilize both the the the, the barbarian and the civilized at the same time, which is terrifying uh, if you think about it for 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 a moment. Anyhow, um, when we appreciate that uh, Roman scale, we realize also that the moment of the origin, it's the reason why I make this video, it is crucial. The 5th century, in many ways, is one of the most important periods um, in, in Roman history, if not the most important, um, as far as the the beginning of the of the rise, right, and the awareness of the divine mission, and thus the um, the center of the same Roman expansion. And this use we will make a video now, but soon about the allied manpower of Rome, right? That's that's crucial because to stress even more how convincing the Roman Evangelion really was. But the need for land, and naturally the people who inhabited it, that's the point. Um, and the hope also for, of, of profit, that especially was meant, again, to redeem those masses that were now being you know, framed brutally in, in a disciplined fashion under the aristocratic commanders and sent to win or die, um, is all part of a deep um, realization about the same mechanism essentially the phone call that highlights as far as the necessity of the combination of the rational element of the elite, of the primordial um, hatred of the people but also just of the gamble of the war, of just going out there and testing yourself because without that there cannot be any form of improvement Right, and so Vu escapes the world in a in a material fashion, <laughs> right, and, and not metaphorically meaning that they have just to stress the spiritual side of the story, which is not just sit sitting there doing nothing, or simply ignoring what is happening in the world in terms of power that is always uh, divine in nature, for a reason or another. Well, the question. Um, remains open. That is, what are we up to today? And why are we still reading the past um, in ways that do not make sense because simply they do not answer the ultimate question? Which which these people in Sen had incredibly clearly outlined, or at least, you know, were already kind of wavering uh, in many ways, at some point we could make a video of our understanding comparatively in what did Rome differ from the others, because these principles were of course known, but the degree and the, the cultural influences weren't, right? Uh, it, it's quite important to acknowledge why that was the case, right? Um, and it may have not happened, I mean, at least if you don't believe in 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 de uh, say in destiny as in fact they didn't believe themselves because there was a fate but uh, the hero can break that right in fact the fortuna kaiser is, is quite uh, meaningful there, there is a user just a few days ago who commented on that saying look also in beowulf there is the saying that sometimes you know destiny spares those who are you know were up to them and, and yeah because that's exactly what they believe like a patrician would have believed that a plebeian would have been believed just in fate in a way also for being led but the differences are enormous just even in 
military music. You know, that cavalry is more Apollonian, uses trumpets, and the, the infantry is uh, orphically hypnotized with drums, etc., to maintain the, the, the rolling uh, necessary to, to go there. As the phalanx, as we were saying before, the rolling lock, yeah. it's an equivalence towards the enemy, right? Um, so, never, never underestimate how much uh, wealth of, of meaning is present, even just through an etymology. And you can imagine through the, through, through the significance of an entire historical uh, phenomenon like this one, right? So that's good reason why we should all study history and also thinking of the Roman one in particular as a unique moment, not just because you want to say uh, something measurable in a in a human fashion. Um, if not for the divine spark that is present there and that was lit right by by Rome at this point of history. Anyhow, I hope that this series about the um, Roman conquest of Italy that we will keep discussing in other videos suits you. Um, for today, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. I thank you heartily as always for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.